Chapter Five of the Canadians of Old by Philippe Aubert de Gaspé, translated by Sir Charles G. D. Roberts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. The breaking up of the ice. On entendit du côté de la mer un bruit épouvantable, comme si des torrents d'eau mêlés à des tonnerres eussent roulé du haut des montagnes tout le monde s'écria voilà l'ouragan bernardin de saint pierre though aged he was so iron of limb few of your youths could cope with him byron que j'aille à son secours s'écria-t-il ou que je meure bernardin de saint pierre les vents et les vagues sont toujours de côté de plus habiles nagères. Gibbon. The travellers merrily continued their journey. The day drew to a close, and they kept on for a time by starlight. At length the moon rose and shone far over the still bosom of the St. Lawrence. At the sight of her, Jules broke out into rhapsodies and cried, i feel myself inspired not by the waters of hippocrene which i have never tasted and which i trust i never shall taste but by the kindly juice of bacchus dearer than all the fountains in the world not even excepting the limpid wave of parnassus hail to thee fair moon hail to thee thou silvern lamp that lightest the steps of two men free as the children of our mighty forests two men but now escaped from the shackles of college how many times o moon has thy pale rays pierced to my lonely couch how many times have i longed to break my bonds and mingle with the joyous throngs at balls and routs while a harsh and inexorable decree condemned me to a sleep which i abhorred ah how many times o moon have i sighed to traverse mounted upon thy crescent at the risk of breaking my neck the regions thou wast illuminating in thy stately course even though it should take me to another hemisphere ah how many times ah how many times in thy life hast thou talked nonsense exclaimed archie but since frenzy is infectious listen now to a true poet and abase thyself proud spirit o moon thou of the threefold essence thou whom the poets of old invoked as artemis the huntress how sweet it must be to thee to forsake the dark realms of pluto and not less the forests wherein with thy baying pack thou raisest a din enough to deafen all the demons of canada how sweet it must be to thee o moon to journey now in tranquil dominance in stupendous silence the ethereal spaces of heaven repent of thy work i beseech thee restore the light of reason to this poor afflicted one my dearest friend who o oh, phoebe patron of fools interrupted jules not for my friend have i any prayer to make thee thou art all guiltless of his infirmity for the mischief was done i say gentlemen exclaimed jose when you are done your conversation with my lady moon i don't know how you find so much to say to her would it please you to notice what a noise they are making in saint thomas yonder all listened intently it was the church bell pealing wildly it is the angelus exclaimed jules d'aberville oh yes exclaimed jose the angelus at eight o'clock in the evening then it's a fire said archie but we don't see any flames answered jose whatever it is let's make haste there is something unusual going on yonder driving as fast as they could half an hour later they entered the village of saint thomas all was silence the village appeared deserted only the dogs shut up in some of the houses were barking madly but for the noise of the curs they might have thought themselves transported into that city which we read of in the arabian nights whose inhabitants had all been turned into marble 
our travellers were on the point of entering the church the bell of which was still ringing when they noticed a light and heard shouts from the bank by the rapids near the manor house thither they made their way at full speed it would take the pen of a cooper or a chateaubriand to paint the scene that met their eyes on the bank of south river captain marcheterre an old sailor of powerful frame was returning to the village toward dusk at a brisk pace when he heard out on the river a noise like some heavy body falling into the water and immediately afterward the groans and cries of some one appealing for help it was a rash habitant named dumay who thinking the ice yet sufficiently firm had ventured upon it with his team about a dozen rods southwest of the town the ice had split up so suddenly that his team vanished in the current the unhappy dumay a man of great activity had just succeeded in springing from the sled to a stronger piece of ice but the violence of the effort had proved disastrous catching his foot in a crevice he had snapped his leg at the ankle like a bit of glass marcheterre who knew the dangerous condition of the ice which was split in many places shouted to him not to stir and that he was going to bring him help he ran at once to the sexton telling him to ring the alarm while he was routing out the nearest neighbors in a moment all was bustle and confusion men ran hither and thither without accomplishing anything women and children began to cry dogs began to howl sounding every note of the canine gamut so that the captain whose experience pointed him out as the one to direct the rescue had great difficulty in making himself heard however under the directions of marcheterre some ran for ropes and boards while others stripped the fences and woodpiles of their cedar and birch bark to make torches the scene grew more and more animated and by the light of fifty torches shedding abroad their fitful glare the crowd spread along the river bank to the spot pointed out by the old sailor dumay waited patiently enough for the coming of help as soon as he could make himself heard he implored them to hurry for he was beginning to hear under the ice low grumbling sounds which seemed to come from far off toward the river's mouth there's not a moment to lose my friends exclaimed the old captain for that is a sign the ice is going to break up men less experienced than he wished immediately to thrust out upon the ice their planks and boards without waiting to tie them together but this he forbade for the ice was already full of cracks and moreover the ice cake which supported dumay was isolated having on one side the shattered surface where the horse had been engulfed and on the other a large air hole which cut off all approach marsh terre who knew that the breaking up was not only inevitable but to be expected at any moment was unwilling to risk the life of so many people without taking every precaution that his experience could dictate some thereupon with hatchets began to notch the planks and boards some tied them together end to end some with the captain at their head dragged them out on the ice while others were pushing from the bank this improvised bridge was not more than fifty feet from the bank when the old sailor cried now boys let some strong active fellows follow me at a distance of ten feet from one another and let the rest keep pushing as before marsh terre was closely followed by his son a young man in the prime of life who knowing his father's boldness kept within reach in order to help him in case of need for lugubrious mutterings the ominous forerunners of a mighty cataclysm were making themselves heard beneath the ice but every one was at his post and every one doing his utmost those who broke through dragged themselves out by means of the floating bridge and once more on the solid ice resumed their efforts with renewed zeal two or three minutes more and dumay would be saved the two marcheterres the father ahead were within about a hundred feet of the wretched victim of his own imprudence when a subterranean thunder such as precedes a strong shock of earthquake 
seemed to run the whole length of south river this subterranean sound was at once followed by an explosion like the discharge of a great piece of artillery then rose a terrible cry the ice is going the ice is going save yourselves screamed the crowd on shore indeed the ice cakes were shivering on all sides under the pressure of the flood which was already invading the banks then followed dreadful confusion the ice cakes turned completely over climbed upon each other with a frightful grinding noise piled themselves to a great height then sank suddenly and disappeared beneath the waves the planks and boards were tossed about like cockle shells in an ocean gale the ropes and chains threatened every moment to give away the spectators horror-stricken at the sight of their kinsfolk exposed to almost certain destruction kept crying save yourselves save yourselves it would have been indeed tempting providence to continue any longer the rash and unequal struggle with the flood marsh terre however who seemed rather inspired than daunted by the appalling spectacle ceased not to shout forward boys forward for god's sake this old sea lion ever cool and unmoved when on the deck of his reeling ship and directing a manoeuvre on whose success the lives of all depended was just as calm in the face of a peril which froze the boldest hearts turning round he perceived that with the exception of his son and joncas one of his sailors the rest had all sought safety in a headlong flight oh you cowards you cowards he cried he was interrupted by his son who seeing him rushing to certain death seized him and threw him down on a plank where he held him some moments in spite of the old man's mighty struggles then followed a terrible conflict between father and son it was filial love against that sublime self-abnegation the love of humanity the old man by a tremendous effort succeeded in throwing himself off the plank and he and his son rolled on to the ice where the struggle was continued fiercely at this crisis joncas leaping from plank to plank from board to board came to the young man's assistance the spectators who from the shore lost nothing of the heart-rending scene in spite of the water already pursuing them made haste to draw in the ropes and the united efforts of a hundred brawny arms were successful in rescuing the three heroes scarcely indeed had they reached a place of safety when the great sheet of ice which had hitherto remained stationary in spite of the furious attacks of the enemy assailing it on all sides groaning and with a slow majesty of movement began its descent toward the falls all eyes were straightway fixed upon dumay he was a brave man many a time had he proved his courage upon the enemies of his country he had even faced the most hideous of deaths when bound to a post he was on the point of being burned alive by the iroquois which he would have been but for the timely aid of his friends the melicites now he was sitting on his precarious refuge calm and unmoved as a statue of death he made some signs toward the shore which the spectators understood as a last farewell to his friends then folding his arms or occasionally lifting them toward heaven he appeared to forget all earthly ties and to prepare himself for passing the dread limits which divide man from the eternal once safely ashore the captain displayed no more of his anger regaining his customary coolness he gave his orders calmly and precisely let us take our floating bridge said he and follow yonder sheet of ice down river what is the use cried some who appeared to have had experience the poor fellow is beyond the reach of help there's one chance yet one little chance of saving him said the old sailor giving ear to certain sounds which he heard far off to the southward and we must be ready for it the ice is on the point of breaking up in the saint nicolas which as you know is very rapid 
the violence of the flood at that point is likely to crowd the ice of south river over against our shore and what's more we shall have no reason to reproach ourselves it fell out as captain marcheterre predicted in a moment or two there was a mighty report like a peal of thunder and the saint nicolas bursting madly from its fetters hurled itself upon the flank of the vast procession of ice floes which having hitherto encountered no obstacle were pursuing their triumphant way to the st lawrence it seemed for a moment that the fierce and swift attack the sudden thrust was going to pile the greater part of the ice cakes upon the other shore as the captain hoped the change it wrought was but momentary for the channel getting choked there was an abrupt halt and the ice cakes piling one upon another took the shape of a lofty rampart checked by this obstacle the waves spread far beyond both shores and flooded the greater part of the village this sudden deluge driving the spectators from the banks destroyed the last hope of poor dumais the struggle was long and obstinate between the angry element and the obstacle which blocked its course but at length the great lake ceaselessly fed by the main river and the tributaries rose to the top of the dam whose foundations it was at the same time eating away from beneath the barrier unable to resist the stupendous weight burst with a roar that shook both banks as south river widened suddenly below its junction with the saint nicolas the unchained mass darted downstream like an arrow and its course was unimpeded to the cataract dumais had resigned himself to his fate calm amid the tumult his hands crossed upon his breast his eyes lifted heavenward he seemed absorbed in contemplation the spectators crowded toward the cataract to see the end of the tragedy numbers roused by the alarm bell had gathered on the other shore and had supplied themselves with torches by stripping off the bark from the cedar rails the dreadful scene was lighted as if for a festival one could see in the distance the long imposing structure of the manor house to the southwest of the river it was built on the top of a knoll overlooking the basin and ran parallel to the falls about a hundred feet from the manor house rose the roof of a sawmill the sluice of which was connected with the fall itself two hundred feet from the mill upon the crest of the fall were sharply outlined the remnants of a little island upon which for ages the spring floods had spent their fury shorn of its former size for it had once been a peninsula the islet was now not more than twelve feet square of all the trees that had once adorned the spot there remained but a single cedar this veteran which for so many years had braved the fury of the equinoxes and the ice floods of south river had half given way before the relentless assaults its crown hung sadly over the abyss in which it threatened soon to disappear several hundred feet from this islet stood a grist mill to the northwest of the fall owing to a curve in the shore the tremendous mass of ice which drawn by the fall was darting down the river with frightful speed crowded all into the channel between the islet and the flour mill the sluice of which was demolished in a moment then the ice cakes piling themselves against the timbers to the height of the roof ended by crushing the mill itself as if it had been a house of cards the ice having taken this direction the channel between the sawmill and the island was comparatively free the crowd kept running along the bank and watching with horrified interest the man whom nothing short of a miracle could save from a hideous death indeed up to within about thirty feet of the island dumais was being carried farther and farther from his only hope of rescue when an enormous ice cake dashing down with furious speed struck one corner of the piece on which he was sitting and diverted it violently from its course 
it wheeled upon the little island and came in contact with the ancient cedar the only barrier between dumay and the abyss the tree groaned under the shock its top broke off and vanished in the foam relieved of this weight the old tree recovered itself suddenly and made ready for one more struggle against the enemies it had so often conquered dumay thrown forward by the unexpected shock clasped the trunk of the cedar convulsively with both arms supporting himself on one leg he clung there desperately while the ice swayed and cracked and threatened every instant to drag him from his frail support nothing was lacking to the lurid and dreadful scene the hurrying torches on the shores threw a grim light on the ghastly features and staring eyes of the poor wretch thus hanging by a hair above the gulf of death unquestionably dumay was brave but in this position of unspeakable horror he lost his self-control marcheterre and his friends however still cherished a hope of saving him descrying on the shore near the sawmill two great pieces of squared timber they dragged these to a rock which projected into the river about two hundred feet above the fall to each of these timbers they attached a cable and launched them forth in hopes that the current would carry them upon the island vain attempt they could not thrust them far enough out into the stream and the timbers anchored as it were by the weight of the chains kept swaying midway between shore and island it seemed impossible to add to the awful sublimity of the picture but on the shore was being enacted a most impressive scene it was religion preparing the christian to appear before the dread tribunal it was religion supporting him to endure the final agony the parish priest who had been at a sick bed was now upon the scene he was a tall old man of ninety the burden of years had not availed to bend this modern nestor who had baptized and married all his parishioners and had buried three generations of them his long hair white as snow and tossed by the night wind made him look like a prophet of old he stood erect on the shore his hands stretched out to the miserable dumay he loved him he had christened him he had prepared him for that significant rite of the catholic church which seems suddenly to touch a child's nature with something of the angelic he loved him also as the husband of an orphan girl whom the old priest had brought up he loved him for the sake of his two little ones who were the joy of his old age standing there on the shore like the angel of pity he not only administered the consolations of his sacred office but spoke to him tender words of love he promised him that the seigneur would never let his family come to want finally seeing the tree yield more and more before every shock he cried in a loud voice broken with sobs my son make me the act of contrition and i will give you absolution a moment later in a voice that rang clear above the roaring of the flood and of the cataract the old priest pronounced these words my son in the name of god the father in the name of jesus christ his son by whose authority i speak in the name of the holy ghost your sins are forgiven you amen and all the people sobbed amen then nature reasserted herself and the old man's voice was choked with tears again he regained his self-control and cried kneel brethren while i say the prayers for the dying once more the old priest's voice soared above the tumult as he cried blessed soul we dismiss you from the body in the name of god the father almighty who created you in the name of jesus christ who suffered for you in the name of the holy ghost in whom you were regenerate and born again in the name of the angels and the archangels in the name of the thrones and the dominions in the name of the cherubim and seraphim in the name of the patriarchs and prophets in the name of the blessed monks and nuns and all the saints of god 
the peace of god be with you this day and your dwelling for ever in sion through jesus christ our lord amen and all the people wailed amen a death-like silence fell upon the scene when suddenly shrieks were heard in the rear of the crowd and a woman in disordered garments her hair streaming out behind her carrying a child in her arms and dragging another at her side pushed her way wildly to the river's edge it was the wife of dumay dwelling about a mile and a half from the village she had heard the alarm bell but being alone with her children whom she could not leave she had resigned herself as best she could till her husband should return and tell her the cause of the excitement the woman when she saw her husband thus hanging on the lip of the fall uttered but one cry a cry so terrible that it pierced every heart and sank in a merciful unconsciousness she was carried to the manor-house where every care was lavished upon her by madame de beaumont and her family as for dumais at the sight of his wife and children a hoarse scream inarticulate and like the voice of a wounded beast forced its way from his lips and made all that heard it shudder then he appeared to fall into a kind of stupor at the very moment when the old priest was administering the absolution our travellers arrived upon the scene jules thrust through the crowd and took his place between the priest and his uncle de beaumont archie on the other hand pushed forward to the water's edge folded his arms took a rapid survey of the situation and calculated the chances of rescue after a moment's thought he bounded rather than ran toward the group surrounding marcheterre he began to strip off his clothes and to give directions at the same time his words were few and to the point captain i am like a fish in the water there is no danger for me but for the poor fellow yonder in case i should strike that block of ice too hard and dash it from its place stop me about a dozen feet above the island that i may calculate the distance better and break the shock your own judgment will tell you what else to do now for a strong rope but as light as possible and a good sailor's knot while the old captain was fastening the rope under his arms he attached another rope to his body taking the coil in his right hand thus equipped he sprang into the river where he disappeared for an instant but when he came to the surface the current bore him rapidly toward the shore he made the mightiest efforts to gain the island but without succeeding seeing which marcheterre made all haste to draw him back to land before his strength was exhausted the moment he was on shore he made his way to the jutting rock the spectators scarcely breathed when they saw archie plunge into the flood every one knew of his giant strength his exploits as a swimmer during his vacation visits to the manor-house of beaumont the anxiety of the crowd therefore had been intense during the young man's superhuman efforts and on seeing his failure a cry of disappointment went up from every breast jules d'aberville was all unaware of his friend's heroic undertaking of an emotional and sympathetic nature he could not endure the heart-rending sight that met his view after one glance of measureless pity he had fixed his eyes on the ground and refused to raise them this human being suspended on the verge of the bellowing gulf this venerable priest administering from afar under the open heaven the sacrament of penance the anguished prayers the sublime invocation all seemed to him a dreadful dream absorbed in these conflicting emotions jules d'aberville had no idea of archie's efforts to save dumay he had heard the lamentations which greeted the first fruitless effort and had attributed them to some little variation in the spectacle from which he withheld his gaze the bond between these two friends was no ordinary tie it was the love between a david and a jonathan passing the love of woman 
jules indeed spared archie none of his ridicule but the privilege of tormenting was one which he would permit no other to share unlucky would he be who should affront lochiel in the presence of the impetuous young frenchman whence arose this passionate affection the young men had apparently little in common lochiel was somewhat cold in demeanour while jules was exuberantly demonstrative they resembled one another however in one point of profoundest importance they were both high-hearted and generous to the last degree jose who had been watching lochiel's every movement and who well knew the extravagance of jules devotion had slipped behind his young master and stood ready to restrain by force if necessary this fiery and indomitable spirit the anxiety of the spectators became almost unendurable over archie's second attempt to save dumais whom they regarded as utterly beyond hope the convulsive trembling of the unhappy man showed that his strength was rapidly ebbing nothing but the old priest's prayers broke the deathly silence as for lochiel his failure had but strengthened him in his heroic purpose he saw clearly that the effort was likely to cost him his life the rope his only safety might well break when charged with a double burden and doubly exposed to the torrent's force too skilful a swimmer was he not to realize the peril of endeavoring to rescue one who could in no way help himself preserving his coolness however he merely said to marcheterre we must change our tactics it is this coil of rope in my right hand which has hampered me from first to last thereupon he enlarged the loop which he passed over his right shoulder and under his left armpit in order to leave both arms free this done he made a bound like that of a tiger and disappearing beneath the waves which bore him downward at a lightning speed he did not come to the surface until within about a dozen feet of the island where according to agreement marcheterre checked his course this movement appeared likely to prove fatal for losing his balance he was so turned over that his head remained under the waves while the rest of his body was held horizontally on the surface of the current happily his coolness did not desert him in this crisis so great was his confidence in the old sailor the latter promptly let out two more coils of rope with a jerky movement and lochiel employing one of those devices which are known to skilful swimmers drew his heels suddenly up to his hips thrust them out perpendicularly with all his strength beat the water violently on one side with his hands and so regained his balance then thrusting forward his right shoulder to protect his breast from a shock which might be as fatal to himself as to dumais he was swept upon the island in a flash dumais in spite of his apparent stupor had lost nothing of what was passing a ray of hope had struggled through his despair at sight of lochiel's tremendous leap from the summit of the rock scarcely had the latter indeed reached the edge of the ice where he clung with one hand while loosening with the other the coil of rope than dumais dropping his hold on the cedar took such a leap upon his one uninjured leg that he fell into archie's very arms the torrent at once rose upon the ice which borne down by the double weight reared like an angry horse the towering mass pushed irresistibly by the torrent fell upon the cedar and the old tree after a vain resistance sank into the abyss dragging with it in its fall a large portion of the domain over which it had held sway for centuries mighty was the shout that went up from both banks of south river a shout of triumph from the more distant spectators a heart-rending cry of anguish from those nearer the stage whereon this drama of life and death was playing itself out indeed all had disappeared as if the wand of a mighty enchanter had been waved over scene and actors from bank to bank in all its breadth the cataract displayed nothing but a line of gigantic waves 
falling with a sound of thunder and a curtain of pale foam waving to the summit of its crest jules d'haberville had not recognized his friend till the moment when for the second time he plunged into the waves having often witnessed his exploits as a swimmer and knowing his tremendous strength jules had manifested at first merely a bewildered astonishment but when he saw his friend disappear beneath the torrent he uttered such a mad cry as comes from the heart of a mother at sight of the mangled body of an only son wild with grief he was on the point of springing into the river when he felt himself imprisoned by the iron arms of josse prayers threats cries of rage and despair blows and bites all were utterly wasted on the faithful josse there there my dear master jules said josse strike me bite me if that's any comfort to you but for god's sake be calm you'll see your friend again all right enough you know he dives like a porpoise and one never knows when he is going to come up again when once he goes under water be calm my dear little master jules you wouldn't want to be the death of poor chausse who loves you so and who has so often carried you in his arms your father sent me to bring you from quebec i am answerable for you body and soul and it won't be my fault if i don't hand you over to him safe and sound otherwise you see master jules why just a little bullet through old jose's head but hold on there's the captain hauling in the rope with all his might and you may be sure master archie is on the other end of it and lively as ever it was as jose said marsh terre and his companions in furious haste were running down the shore and by mighty armfuls dragging in the rope at the end of which they felt a double burden in another moment the weight was dragged ashore it was all that they could do to set lochiel free from the convulsive clasp of dumais who gave no other sign of life archie on the other hand when delivered from the embrace which was strangling him vomited a few mouthfuls of water breathed hoarsely and exclaimed he is not dead it is nothing more than a swoon he was lively enough a minute ago dumais was carried in all haste to the manor-house where everything that the most loving care could suggest was done for him at the end of a half-hour some drops of wholesome moisture gathered upon his brow and a little later he reopened haggard eyes after staring wildly about the room for a time he at length fixed his regard upon the old priest the latter placed his ear to dumais's lips and the first words he gathered were my wife my children mr archie be at ease my dear dumais said the old man your wife has recovered from her swoon but as she believes you to be dead i must be careful how i tell her of your deliverance lest i kill her with joy as soon as prudent i will bring her to you meanwhile here is mr de lochiel to whom through god you owe your life at the sight of his deliverer whom he had not yet recognized among the attendants who crowded about him a change came over the sick man he embraced archie he pressed his lips to his cheek and a flood of tears broke from his eyes how can i ever repay you said he for all you have done for me for my poor wife and for my children by getting well again as soon as possible answered lochiel gaily the seigneur has sent a messenger post haste to quebec to fetch the most skilful surgeon and another to place relays of horses along the whole route so that by midday to-morrow at the latest your leg will be so well set that within two months you will be able again to carry the musket against your old enemies the iroquois when the old priest entered the room whither they had taken his adopted daughter the latter was sitting up in bed holding her youngest child in her arms while the other slept at her feet pale as death cold and unresponsive to all that was said by madame de beaumont and the other women she kept repeating incessantly my husband my poor husband 
i shall not even be allowed to kiss the dead body of my husband the father of my children when she saw the old priest she stretched out her arms to him and cried is it you my father you who have been so kind to me since childhood is it you who can have a heart to come and tell me all is over no i know your love too well you cannot bring such a message speak i implore you you whose lips can utter nothing but good your husband said the old man will receive christian burial he is dead then cried the unhappy woman and for the first time she burst into tears this was the reaction which the old priest looked for my daughter said he but a moment ago you were praying as a peculiar favor that you might be permitted once more to embrace the body of your husband and god has heard your petition trust in him for the mighty hand which has plucked your husband out of the abyss is able also to give him back to life the young woman answered with a fresh storm of sobs he is the same all-merciful god went on the old priest who said to lazarus in the tomb friend i say unto you arise all hope is not yet lost for your husband in his present state of suffering the poor woman who had hitherto listened to her old friend without understanding him seemed suddenly to awaken as from a horrible nightmare and clasping her sleeping children in her arms she sprang to the door on the meeting between dumais and his family we will not intrude now let us go to supper said the seigneur to his venerable friend we all need it but more especially this heroic young man added he bringing archie forward gently gently my dear sir said the old priest we have first a more pressing duty to fulfil we have to thank god who has so manifested his favour this night all present fell on their knees and the old priest in a short but touching prayer rendered thanks to him who commands the sea in its fury who holds his creatures in the hollow of his hand End of chapter 5chapter six of the canadians of old by philippe aubert de gaspe translated by sir charles g d roberts this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary a supper at the house of a french canadian seigneur half cut down a pasty costly made where quail and pigeon lark and leveret lay like fossils of the rock with golden yolks embedded and enjellied. Tennyson. The table was spread in a low but spacious room, whose furniture, though not luxurious, lacked nothing of what an Englishman calls comfort. A thick woolen carpet of Canadian manufacture and of a diamond pattern covered the greater part of the dining room floor the bright woolen curtains the backs of the mahogany sofa ottomans and chairs were embroidered with gigantic birds such as it would have puzzled the most brilliant ornithologist to classify a great sideboard reaching almost to the ceiling displayed on its many shelves a service of blue marseilles china of a thickness to defy the awkwardness of the servants over the lower part of this sideboard which served the purpose of a cupboard and which might be called the ground floor of the structure projected a shelf a foot and a half wide on which stood a sort of tall narrow cabinet whose drawers lined with green cloth held the silver spoons and forks on this shelf also were some bottles of old wine together with a great silver jar of water for the use of those who cared to dilute their beverage a pile of plates of the finest porcelain two decanters of white wine a couple of tarts a dish of whipped cream some delicate biscuits a bowl of sweetmeats on a little table near the sideboard covered with a white cloth constituted the dessert in one corner of the room stood a sort of barrel-shaped fountain of blue and white stone china 
with faucet and basin where the family might rinse their hands in an opposite corner a great closet containing square bottles filled with brandy absinthe liqueurs of peach kernel raspberry black currant anise etc for daily use completed the furnishing of the room the table was set for eight persons a silver fork and spoon wrapped in a napkin were placed at the left of each plate and a bottle of light wine at the right there was not a knife on the table during the serving of the courses each was already supplied with this useful instrument which only the orientals know how to do without if the knife one affected was a clasp knife it was carried in the pocket if a sheath knife it was worn suspended from the neck in a case of morocco of silk or even of birch bark artistically wrought by the indians the handles were usually of ivory riveted with silver those for the use of ladies were of mother of pearl to the right of each plate was a silver cup or goblet these cups were of different forms and sizes some being of simple pattern with or without hoops some with handles some in the form of a chalice some worked in relief and very many lined with gold a servant placing on a side table the customary appetizers namely brandy for the men and sweet cordials for the women came to announce that the supper was served eight persons sat down at the table the seigneur de beaumont and his wife their sister madame des carrieres the old priest captain marcheterre and his son henri and lastly archie and jules the lady of the house gave the place of honor at her right to the priest and the next place at her left to the old captain the menu opened with an excellent soup soup was then de rigueur for dinner and supper alike followed by a cold pasty called the easter pasty which on account of its immense proportions was served on a great tray covered with a napkin this pasty which would have aroused the envy of Bria savarin consisted of one turkey two chickens two partridges two pigeons the backs and thighs of two rabbits all larded with slices of fat pork the balls of force meat on which rested as on a thick soft bed these gastronomic riches were made of two hams of that animal which the jew despises but which the christian treats with more regard large onions scattered here and there and a liberal seasoning of the finest spices completed the appetizing marvel but a very important point was the cooking which was beset with difficulty for should the gigantic structure be allowed to break it would lose at least fifty per cent of its flavor to guard against so lamentable a catastrophe the lower crust coming at least three inches up the sides was not less than an inch thick this crust itself saturated with the juices of all the good things inside was one of the best parts of this unique dish chickens and partridges roasted in slices of pork pig's feet a la sainte menehould a hare stew very different from that with which the spanish landlord regaled the unhappy gil blas these were among the other dishes which the seigneur set before his friends for a time there was silence with great appetites but when dessert was reached the old sailor who had been eating like a hungry wolf and drinking proportionately and all the time managing to keep his eyes on archie was the first to break the silence it would seem young man said he facetiously that you are not much afraid of a cold in your head it would seem also that you don't really need to breathe the air of heaven and that like your cousins the beaver and otter you only put your nose out of water every half hour for form's sake and to see what's going on in the upper world you are a good deal like a salmon when one gives him line he knows how to profit by it it's my opinion however that gudgeons like you are not found in every brook it was only your presence of mind captain said archie your admirable judgment in letting out the exact quantity of rope 
that prevented me smashin my head or my stomach on the ice but for you poor dumay instead of being warm in bed would now be rolling under the st lawrence ice a nice joke cried marcheter to hear him talk as if i had done the thing it was very necessary to give you line when i saw that you threatened to stand on your head which would have been a very uncomfortable position in those waves i wish to the d beg pardon your reverence i was just going to swear it is a habit with us sailors nonsense laughed the old priest you have been accustomed to it so long you old sinner that one more or less hardly matters your record is full and you no longer keep count of them when the tallyboard is quite full reverend father said marcheter you shall just pass the plane over it as you have done so often before and we'll run up another score moreover i am sure not to escape you for you know so well when and where to hook me and drag me into a blessed harbour with the rest of the sinners you are too severe sir said jules how could you wish to deprive our dear captain of the comfort of swearing a little if only against his darky cook who burns his fricassees as black as his own fizz you hare-brained young scoundrel cried the captain with a comical assumption of anger do you dare talk to me so after the trick you played me i said jules innocently i played you a trick i am incapable of it dear captain you are slandering me cruelly just listen to the young saint said marcheter i slandering him no matter let us drop the subject for a moment lay to for a bit boy i shall know how to find you again soon i was going to say continued the captain when his reverence tumbled my unfortunate exclamation to the bottom of the hold and shut the hatch down on it that if out of curiosity mr archie you had gone down to the foot of the fall then like your confrere the salmon you would probably have shown us the trick of swimming up it again the spirit of mirth now ruled the conversation and in repartee and witticism the company found relief from the intense emotions to which they had been subjected fill your glasses attention everybody cried the seigneur de beaumont i am going to propose a health which will i am very sure be received with acclamation it is very easy for you to talk said the old priest whom they had honored especially by giving him a goblet richly carved but holding nearly double what those of the other guests could contain i am over ninety and i have no longer the hard head of a twenty-five year old come my old friend said the seigneur you will not have far to go for you must sleep here to-night moreover if your legs should become unsteady it will pass for the weakness of old age and no one will be shocked you forget seigneur said the priest laughing that i have accepted your kind invitation to help take care of poor dumay to-night i intend to sit up with him if i take too much wine what use do you think i could be to the poor fellow indeed you shall go to bed said the seigneur the master of the house decrees it we will rouse you in case of need have no anxiety as to dumay and his wife their friend mrs couture is with them i am even sending home after they have supped a lot of their gossips and cronies who wanted to be in the way all night and use up the fresh air which the sick man is so much in need of we will all be up if necessary you argue so well answered the priest that i must even do as you say and he poured a fair quantity of wine into his formidable cup then the seigneur de beaumont said to archie with solemn emphasis what you have done is beyond all praise i know not which is most admirable the splendid spirit of self-sacrifice which moved you to risk your life for that of a stranger or the courage and coolness which enabled you to succeed you possess all the qualities most requisite to the career you are to follow a soldier myself 
i prophesy great success for you let us drink to the health of mr de lochiel the toast was drunk with ardent enthusiasm in returning thanks archie said modestly i am bewildered by so much praise for so simple a performance i was probably the only one present who knew how to swim for any one else would have done as i did it is claimed that your indian women throw their infants into the water and let them make the best of their way to shore this teaches them to swim very early i am tempted to believe that our mothers in the scottish highlands follow the same excellent custom as long as i can remember i have been a swimmer at your fooling again mr archie said the captain as for me i have been a sailor these fifty years and i have never yet learned how to swim not that i have never fallen into the water but i have always had the good luck to catch hold of something failing that i always kept my feet going as cats and dogs do sooner or later some one always hauled me out and here i am that reminds me of a little adventure which happened to me when i was a sailor my ship was anchored by the banks of the mississippi it might have been about nine o'clock in the evening after one of those suffocating days which one can experience only in the tropics i had made my bed up in the bows of my ship in order to enjoy the evening breezes but for the mosquitoes the sand flies the black flies and the infernal noise of the alligators which had gathered i think from the utmost limits of the father of streams to give me a good serenading a monarch of the east might have envied me my bed i am not naturally timid but i have an unconquerable horror of all kinds of reptiles whether they crawl on land or wriggle in the water captain you have a refined and aristocratic taste which does you much honor said jules do you dare to speak to me again you disreputable cried marcheterre shaking his great fist at him i was about forgetting you but your turn will come very soon meanwhile i go on with my story i was feeling very safe and comfortable on my mat whence i could hear the hungry monsters snapping their jaws i derided them saying you would be delighted my lambs to make a meal off my carcass but there's one little difficulty in the way of it though you should have to fast all your lies through like hermits i would never be the one to break your fasting for my conscience is too tender i don't know exactly how the thing happened but i ended by falling asleep and when i awoke i was in the midst of these jolly companions you could never imagine the horror that seized me in spite of my customary coolness i did not lose my presence of mind however while under water i remembered that there was a rope hanging from the bowsprit as i came to the surface i had the good fortune to catch it i was as active as a monkey in those days but i did not escape without leaving as a keepsake in the throat of a very barbarous alligator one of my boots and a valued portion of the calf of my leg now for your turn you imp continued the captain turning to jules i must get even with you sooner or later for the trick you played me on my return from martinique last year i met monsieur one morning in quebec lower town as he was on the point of crossing the river to return home for his vacation after a perfect squall of embraces from which i escaped with difficulty by shearing off to larboard i commissioned him to tell my family of my arrival and to say that i could not be at saint thomas for several days what did this young saint do he went to my house at eight o'clock in the evening shouting like all possessed o oh joy o oh rapture three cheers and a tiger my husband has come exclaimed madame marcheterre father has come cried my two daughters certainly said he what else could i be making all this fuss about then he kissed my good wife there was no great difficulty in that he wanted to kiss the girls too but they boxed his ears and sheered off with all sails set 
what does your reverence think of this for a beginning to say nothing of what followed ah mr jules cried the old priest these are nice things i am hearing about you queer conduct this for a pupil of the jesuit fathers you see mr abbe said jules that all that was only a bit of fun to enable me to share the happiness of that estimable family i knew too well the ferocious virtue immovable as the cape of storms of these daughters of the sea i well knew that they would box my ears soundly and sheer off with all sails set i begin to believe that you are telling the truth after all said the old priest and that there were no evil designs on your part i know my jules pretty thoroughly worse and more of it said the captain take his part do that's all he was wanting but we'll see what you think when you hear the rest when my young gentleman had finished his larking he said to my wife the captain told me to say he would be here to-morrow evening in the neighbourhood of ten o'clock and that as his business had prospered exceedingly which indeed was all true he wished that his friends should celebrate his good luck with him he wished that there should be a ball and supper going on at his house when he arrived which would be just as the guests were sitting down to table make ready therefore for this celebration to which he has invited myself and my brother de lochiel this puts me out a little added the young hypocrite for i am in a great hurry to get home but for you ladies there is nothing that i would not do my husband does not consider that he is giving me too little time said madame marcheterre we have no market here my cook is very old to undertake so much in one day the case is desperate but to please him we must accomplish the impossible perhaps i can be of some use to you said the hypocrite pretending to sympathize with her i will undertake with pleasure to send out the invitations my dear jules said my wife that would be the greatest help you know our society i give you carte blanche my wife ran all over the parish to get provisions for the feast she and the girls spent the greater part of the night helping the old cook make pastries whipped creams blancmange biscuits and a lot of sweet stuff that i wouldn't give for one steak of fresh codfish such as one gets on the banks of newfoundland mr jules for his part did things up in style that night he sent out two messengers one to the northeast the other to the southwest carrying invitations so that by six o'clock the next evening thanks to his good management my house was full of guests who were whirling around like so many gulls while i was anchored in quebec and poor madame in spite of a frightful cold was doing the honours of the house with the best grace possible what do you think gentlemen of a trick like that and what have you to say in your defence you wolf in sheep's clothing i wished said jules that everybody should share beforehand in the joy of the family over the good fortune of so dear and so generous a friend also if you could have seen the regret and general consternation when toward eleven o'clock it was found necessary to sit down at table without waiting for you any longer you would certainly have been moved to tears the morrow you will remember was a fast day as for your wife she seems to be without the smallest idea of gratitude observing a little before eleven that she was in no hurry to bring on the supper and that she was beginning to be anxious about her dear husband i whispered a word in her ear and for thanks she broke her fan over my back everybody the captain himself included burst out laughing how is it you never told us of this before marcheterre said the seigneur de beaumont it was hardly necessary said the captain to publish it to the world that we had been tricked by this young rascal moreover it would have been no particular satisfaction to us to inform you that you owed the entertainment to the munificence of mr jules d'haberville we preferred to have the credit of it ourselves 
i only tell it to you to-day because it is too good to keep any longer it seems to me mr diver continued marcheterre addressing archie that in spite of your reserved and philosophical demeanour you were an accomplice of master jules i give you my word replied lochiel that i knew nothing of it whatever not till the next day did jules take me into his confidence whereupon i gave him a good scolding you could hardly say much said jules after the rate at which you kicked round your great scotch legs with great peril to the more civilized shins of your neighbors you have doubtless forgotten that since you were not content with french cotillons such as are accepted among all civilized people to please you we had to have scotch reels the music for these our fiddler picked up by ear in an instant it was a very simple matter he merely had to scrape his strings till they screeched as if a lot of cats were shut up in a bag and some one were pulling their tails oh you are a bad lot said the captain but won't you come and take supper with us to-morrow you and your friend and make your peace with the family that's the way to talk now said jules listen to the irrepressible retorted marcheterre as it was now very late the party broke up after drinking the health of the old sailor and his son and pronouncing the eulogies they deserved for the part they had played that night the young men had to stay some days at saint thomas the flood continued the roads were deluged the nearest bridge even supposing it had escaped the general disaster was some leagues southwest of the village and the rain came down in torrents they were obliged to wait till the river should be clear of ice so as to cross in a boat below the falls they divided their time between the seigneur's family their other friends and poor dumais whom the seigneur would not permit to be moved the sick man entertained them with stories of his fights against the english and their savage allies and with accounts of the manners and customs of the aborigines although i am a native of saint thomas said dumais one day i was brought up in the parish of sorel when i was ten years old and my brother nine while we were in the woods one day picking raspberries a party of iroquois surprised and captured us after a long march we came to the place where their canoe was hidden among the brambles by the water's edge and they took us to one of the islands of the st lawrence my father and his three brothers armed to the teeth set out to rescue us they were only four against ten but i may say without boasting that my father and my uncles were not exactly the kind of men to be trifled with they were tall broad-chested fellows with their shoulders well set back it might have been about ten o'clock in the evening my brother and i surrounded by our captors were seated in a little clearing in the midst of thick woods when we heard my father's voice shouting to us lie flat down on your stomachs i immediately seized my little brother around the neck and flattened him down to the ground with me the iroquois were hardly on their feet when four well-aimed shots rang out and four of the band fell squirming like eels the rest of the vermin not wishing i suppose to fire at hazard against the invisible enemies to whom they were serving as targets started for the shelter of the trees but our rescuers gave them no time falling upon them with the butts of their muskets they beat down three at the first charge and the others saved themselves by flight our mother almost died of joy when we were given back to her arms in return lochiel told the poor fellow about the combats of the scottish highlanders their manners and customs and the semi-fabulous exploits of his hero the great wallace while jules amused him with the story of his practical jokes or with such bits of history as he might appreciate when the young men were bidding dumais farewell the latter said to archie with tears in his eyes it is probable sir that i shall never see you again but be sure that i will carry you ever in my heart and will pray for you 
i and my family every day of our lives it is painful for me to think that even should you return to new france a poor man like me would have no means of displaying his gratitude who knows said lochiel perhaps you will do more for me than i have done for you was the highlander gifted with that second sight of which his fellow-countrymen are wont to boast let us judge from the sequel on the thirtieth day of april at ten o'clock in the morning with weather magnificent but roads altogether execrable our travellers bade farewell to their friends at saint thomas they had yet six leagues to go before arriving at saint jean port joli and the whole distance they had to travel afoot cursing at the rain which had removed the last traces of ice and snow in traversing the road across the plain of cap st ignace it was even worse they sank to their knees and their horse was mired to the belly and had to be dug out jules the most impatient of the three kept grumbling if i had had anything to do with the weather we would never have had this devil of a rain which has turned all the roads into bog holes perceiving that jose shook his head whenever he heard this remark he asked him what he meant oh master jules said jose i am only a poor ignorant fellow but i can't help thinking that if you had charge of the weather we shouldn't be much better off take the case of what happened to davy larouche when we get across this cursed bog hole said jules you shall tell us the story of davy larouche oh that i had the legs of a heron like this mighty scotchman who strides before us whistling a pibroch just fit for these roads what would you give said archie to exchange your diminutive french legs for those of the haughty highlander keep your legs retorted jules for when you have to run away from the enemy once well across the meadow the young man asked jos for his story i must tell you said the latter that a fellow named davy larouche once lived in the parish of saint roch he was a good enough provider neither very rich nor very poor i used to think that the dear fellow was not quite sharp enough which prevented him making great headway in the world it happened that one morning davy got up earlier than usual put through his chores in the stable returned to the house fixed his whiskers as if it were sunday and got himself up in his best clothes where are you going my good man asked his wife what a swell you are are you going to see the girls you must understand that this was a joke of hers she knew that her husband was bashful with women and not at all inclined to run after them as for la Tec herself she was the most facetious little body on the whole south side inheriting it from her old uncle bernuchon castonguet she often used to say pointing to her husband you see that great fool yonder certainly not a very polite way to speak of her husband well he would never have had the pluck to ask me in marriage though i was the prettiest girl in the parish if i had not met him more than half way yet how his eyes used to shine whenever he saw me i took pity on him because he wasn't making much progress to be sure i was even more anxious about it than he he had four good acres of land to his name while i had nothing but this fair body of mine she was lying a little to be sure the puss added jose she had a cow a yearling bull six sheep her spinning wheel a box so full of clothes that you had to kneel on it to shut it and in the box fifty silver francs i took pity on him one evening said she when he called at our house and sat in the corner without even daring to speak to me i know you are in love with me you great simpleton said i go and speak to my father who is waiting for you in the next room and you can get the bands published next sunday moreover since he sat there without budging and as red as a turkey-cock i took him by the shoulders and pushed him into the other room 
my father opened a closet and brought out a flask of brandy to encourage him well in spite of all these hints he had to get three drinks into his body before he found his tongue well as i was saying continued jose la tech said to her husband are you going to see the girls my man look out for yourself if you get off any pranks i will let you into the soup you know very well i'm not said la ruche laughingly and flicking her on the back with his whip here we are at the end of march my grain is all thrashed out and i'm going to carry my tithes to the priest that's right my man said his wife who was a good christian we must render back to god a share of what he has just given us la ruche then threw his sacks upon the sled lit his pipe with a hot coal sprang aboard and set off in high spirits as he was passing a bit of woods he met a traveller who approached by a side path this stranger was a tall handsome man of about thirty long fair hair fell about his shoulders his blue eyes were as sweet as an angel's and his countenance wore a sort of tender sadness his dress was a long blue robe tied at the waist la ruche said he had never seen any one so beautiful as this stranger and that the loveliest woman was ugly in comparison peace be with you my brother said the traveller i thank you for your good wishes answered davy a good word burns nobody's mouth but that is something i don't particularly need i am at peace thank god with everybody i have an excellent wife good children we get on well together all my neighbors love me i have nothing to desire in the way of peace i congratulate you said the traveller your sled is well loaded where are you going this morning it is my tithes which i am taking to the priest it would seem then said the stranger that you have had a good harvest reckoning one measure of tithes to every twenty-six measures of clean grain good enough i confess but if i had had the weather just to my fancy it would have been something very much better you think so said the traveller no manner of doubt about it answered davy very well said the stranger now you shall have just what weather you wish and much good may it do you having spoken thus he disappeared around the foot of a little hill that's queer now thought davy i know very well that there are wicked people who go about the world putting spells on men women children or animals take the case of the woman lestin coulombe who on the very day of her wedding made fun of a certain beggar who squinted in his left eye she had good cause to regret it poor thing for he said to her angrily take care young woman that your own children don't turn out cross-eyed she trembled poor creature for every child she brought into the world and not without good cause for the fourteenth when looked at closely showed a blemish on its right eye it seems to me said jules that madame lestin must have had a mighty dread of cross-eyed children if she could not be content to present her dear husband with one even after twenty years of married life evidently she was a thoughtful and easy-going woman who took her time about whatever she was going to do jose shook his head with a dubious air and continued well thought la ruche to himself though bad folk go about the country putting spells on people i have never heard of saints wandering about canada to work miracles after all it is no business of mine i won't say a word about it and we'll see next spring about that time the next year davy very much ashamed of himself got up secretly long before daylight to take his tithes to the priest he had no need of horse or sleigh he carried the whole thing in his handkerchief as the sun was rising he once more met the stranger who said to him peace be with you my brother never was wish more appropriate answered la ruche 
for i believe the devil himself has got into my house and is kicking up his pranks there day and night my wife scolds me to death from morn till eve my children sulk when they are not doing worse and all my neighbors are set against me i am very sorry to hear it said the traveller but what are you carrying in that little parcel my tithes answered la Rouche, with an air of chagrin it seems to me however said the stranger that you have been having just the weather you asked for i acknowledge it said davy when i asked for sunshine i had it when i wanted rain wind calm weather i got them yet nothing has succeeded with me the sun burned up the grain the rain caused it to rot the wind beat it down the calm brought the night frosts my neighbors are all bitter against me they regard me as a sorcerer who has brought a curse on their harvests my wife began by distrusting me and has ended by heaping me with reproaches in a word it is enough to drive one crazy which proves to you my brother said the traveller that your wish was a foolish one that one must always trust to the providence of god who knows what is good for man better than man can know it for himself put your trust in him and you will not have to endure the humiliation of having to carry your tithes in a handkerchief with these words the stranger again disappeared around the hill la Rouge took the hint and thenceforth acknowledged god's providence without wishing to meddle with the weather as jose brought his tale to an end archie said i like exceedingly the simplicity of this legend it has a lofty moral and at the same time it displays the vivid faith of the habitants of new france shame on the heartless philosopher who would deprive them of that whence they derive so many a consolation in the trials of life it must be confessed continued archie later when they were at a little distance from the sleigh that our friend jose has always an appropriate story ready but do you believe that his father really told him that marvellous dream that was dreamed on the hillsides of saint michel i perceive said jules that you do not yet know jose's talents he is an inexhaustible raconteur the neighbors gather in our kitchen on the long winter evenings and jose spins them a story which often goes on for weeks when he feels his imagination beginning to flag he breaks off and says i am getting tired i'll tell you the rest another day jos is also a much more esteemed poet than my learned uncle the chevalier who prides himself on his skill in verse he never fails to sacrifice to the muses either on flesh days or on new year's day if you were at my father's house at such times you would see messengers arrive from all parts of the parish in quest of jos's compositions but he does not know how to write said archie no more do his audience know how to read replied jules this is how they work it they send to the poet a good chanter chanteur as they call him who has a prodigious memory and presto inside of half an hour said chanter has the whole poem in his head for any sorrowful occasion jose is asked to compose a lament and if it be an occasion of mirth he is certain to be in demand that reminds me of what happened to a poor devil of a lover who had taken his sweetheart to a ball without being invited although unexpected they were received with politeness but the young man was so awkward as to trip the daughter of the house while dancing which raised a shout of laughter from all the company the young girl's father being a rough fellow and very angry at the accident took poor jose blay by the shoulders and put him out of the house then he made all manner of excuses to the poor girl whose lover had been so unceremoniously dismissed and would not permit her to leave on hearing of this our friend jos yonder was seized with an inspiration 
and improvised the following naive bit of verse a party after vespers at the house of old boulet but the lads that couldn't dance were asked to stay away mon tonton de ruiten mon tonton de Rite. the lads that couldn't dance were asked to stay away but his heart was set on going was the heart of jose blay mon tonton etc his heart was set on going was the heart of jose blay get done your chores said his mistress and i will not say you nay mon tonton etc get done your chores said his mistress and i will not say you nay so he hurried out to the barn to give the cows their hay mon tonton etc he hurried out to the barn to give the cows their hay he rapped rougette on the nose and on the ribs barre mon tonton etc he rapped rougette on the nose and on the ribs barre and then rubbed down the horses in the quickest kind of way mon tonton etc he rubbed down the horses in the quickest kind of way then dressed him in his vest of red and coat of blue and gray mon tonton etc he dressed him in his vest of red and coat of blue and gray and black cravat and shoes for which he had to pay mon tonton etc his black cravat and shoes for which he had to pay and he took his dear lisette so proud of his display mon tonton etc he took his dear lisette so proud of his display but they kicked him out to learn to dance and call another day mon tonton etc they kicked him out to learn to dance and call another day but they kept his dear lisette his pretty fiancée mon tonton de Riten, mon tonton de Rite. why it is a charming little idyll cried archie laughing what a pity jose had not an education canada would possess one poet the more but to return to the experiences of his late father said jules i believe that the old drunkard after having dared la corriveau a thing which the habitants consider very foolhardy as the dead are sure to avenge themselves sooner or later i believe the old drunkard fell asleep in the ditch just opposite ile d'orleans where the habitants travelling by night always think they see witches i believe also that he suffered a terrible nightmare during which he thought himself attacked by the goblins of the island on the one hand and by la corriveau on the other jose's vivid imagination has supplied the rest for you see how he turns everything to account the pictures in your natural history for instance and the cyclops in my uncle's illustrated virgil of which his dear late father had doubtless never heard a word poor jose how sorry i am for the way i abused him the other day i knew nothing of it until the day following for i had entirely lost my senses on seeing you disappear in the flood i begged his pardon very humbly and he answered what are you still thinking about that trifle why i look back upon it with pleasure now all the racket is over it made me even feel young again reminding me of your furies when you were a youngster when you would scratch and bite like a little wild cat and when i would carry you off in my arms to save you from the punishment of your parents how you used to cry and then when your anger was over you would bring me your playthings to console me faithful jose what unswerving attachment to our family through every trial men with hearts as dry as tinder often look with scorn on such people as jose though possessed of none of their virtues a noble heart is the best gift of god to man as our travellers drew near the manor house of saint jean port joli whose roof they could see under the starlight the conversation of jules d'aberville ordinarily so frivolous and mocking grew more and more thoughtful and sincere End of chapter six